know, someone once said that the difference between an American and any other kind of person is that an American lives in anticipation of the future because he knows it'll be a great place. Now, there are those in our land today, however, who would have us believe that the United States, like other great civilizations of the past, has reached the zenith of its power, that we're weak and fearful, reduced to bickering with each other, and no longer possessed of the will to cope with our problems. Much of this talk has come from leaders who claim that our problems are too difficult to handle. We're supposed to meekly accept their failures as the most which can humanly be done. They tell us we must learn to live with less and teach our children that their lives will be less full and prosperous than ours have been. That the America of the coming years will be a place where, because of our past excesses, it will be impossible to dream and make those dreams come true. I don't believe that. And I don't believe you do either. That's why I'm seeking the presidency. America today in many ways resembles America in the late 70s. There's a lot of cynicism, there's a lot of people who are struggling, and there's a lot of people who strongly believe that our better days were behind us. But I don't believe this is true, and the greatest leader we've had in the last several decades who reminded us to be optimistic about our future uh, was President Ronald Reagan. America was not very happy in his, his he prepared to take over the presidency. And we had planes that couldn't fly and ships that couldn't sail and um, the economy was in bad shape and America just wasn't feeling very good about itself. Ronald Reagan was a uh, unspoken commodity at the time. President Reagan was one of a rare few who lived up to the expectations of commitment and character that we have every right to believe and hope a president should have. I was 12 years old in 1980 when my father was leaving for the polls on election day. I asked him, who are you going to vote for? He said, I'm going to vote for Ronald Reagan. Something has to change. Those of us uh, who remember that time remember that things were pretty bad here in the United States of America. But uh, I just remember having hope when Reagan became president. And I remember that all through his presidency, the full eight years, he was an inspiration and a model and quite honestly, he remains the standard by which I will always, uh, I will always judge every candidate for the high office. He was an example as a president, as an American, and as a man. As we celebrate the 40th anniversary of President Ronald Reagan's inauguration, we have an opportunity to celebrate the achievements and leadership of one of the nation's finest presidents. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. When I first met President Reagan in 1966 as a young lawyer, I was struck by his clear understanding of the principles laid down by our founders. His speech, A Time for Choosing, is one of the most powerful speeches I have ever heard, and it was the blueprint for his success as president. Ronald Reagan was a remarkable man and one of the most gifted and talented and experienced persons ever to be elected president of the United States. He had been an elected union leader multiple times, supervising and leading a group of highly talented and strong-willed individuals during very difficult periods of time in our nation's history. Ronald Reagan was the first U.S. president for whom I had cast a vote. I was born and raised in Orange County, California, which at the time was quite a conservative area. My parents had instilled in me the values of individual freedom, personal responsibility, and limited government all values that President Reagan embodied. So there was little doubt in 1980 for whom I would be casting my vote. President Reagan had an amazing ability to communicate the most difficult and complex topics in a very simple and understandable way. He truly was the great communicator. 
he often used his words and his influential voice uh, as a way to rally people. He did so and, and he reached across the aisle and figured out ways to use compromising perspectives and those kinds of things to get people to unite in common purpose. Ronald Reagan was one of the outstanding leaders in the world and uh, he did it through obviously the strength of his personality. Uh, he was very positive and, uh, you know, she always said, trust but verify. I think people that dealt with him, other foreign leaders or people, whether it's people of Congress or whatever, he was very fair, but he had a set of principles which he stood by. I visited with President Reagan uh, at his office in Los Angeles. He had a small card that he had in his pocket. And, and uh, a le lesson learned for me, he said to me, Jerry, um, on this card, I have uh, five, four or five principles that really matter. Uh, some of which uh, would include limited government, low taxation, peace through strength. Those things matter to him. And he, and he said, um, a number of other things mattered, but I was willing to compromise and accept other people's points of view and it allowed him to work closely with Democrats as well as Republicans. And he taught the world uh, what it meant to compromise, not on your basic principles, but in order to get things done for the American people. But what I think I miss most about Ronald Reagan is his fundamental decency his kindness, his interest in other people, the fact that it was never ever about him. Well, it could be about Nancy from time to time, but it was never ever about him. This was a man with a good heart, who liked people, who cared about them, who didn't care if you were the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or the person who cleaned the office at night. It didn't matter. Ron Reagan was one of the most important people in the world that I have ever met. Ronald Reagan also was one of the nicest people in the whole world that I've ever met. President Reagan was a very compassionate individual. People love to do things for him, with him. You can't spend time with someone like President Reagan and not be completely infatuated with him. The world knows that Ronald Reagan brought a peaceful end to the Cold War, achieved record economic growth, and so much more. But for me, it was his character, his conduct, his conversation that I found most inspiring. I had the opportunity to meet President Reagan for the first time on a private meeting. And I remember shaking hands with him and telling him how much we appreciated uh, his support of the FBI and how our morale had, had increased tremendously under his administration and he pulled me in close. He had such an ingratiating person. He was such a warm person. And he, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Agent Moses, I love the FBI. Well, I remember uh, a great moment uh, on June 6th, 1984, when Ronald Reagan uh, made a tremendously powerful speech on the cliffs of Pointe du Hoc during the 40th anniversary celebration of D-Day. Gentlemen, I look at you and I think of the words of Stephen Spender's poem. You were men who in your, quote, lives fought for life and left the vivid air signed with your honor. And I remember watching him address so many of the service members who had participated in the invasion, uh, many who had climbed those cliffs uh, of Point du Hoc, sitting there in front of him. And uh, I've read that speech uh, several times because it's so powerful. You know, having an organization, the Gary Sinise Foundation, that is dedicated to serving and honoring the needs of the men and women who serve our country, our veterans. Uh, we started a program called Soaring Valor in partnership with the National World War II Museum where we travel World War II veterans to the museum uh, so that they can see this museum that tells their stories. 
And I chose for the inaugural event to quote from Ronald Reagan's 40th anniversary D-Day speech. And I thought about what must it have been like for him to look out at so many of those World War II heroes and address them, many of them, U.S. Army Rangers who had climbed and scaled those cliffs to, uh, of Point Du Hoc. In um, 1984, I was leaving on a trip to India and before I left, I had been working on a special project for the president. So I had written a memo to him uh, explaining where we were and what our progress was. And the phone rings and he said, I was just checking on the project we had talked about. And I said, oh, Mr. President, I uh, had sent a memo to you, but I guess it hadn't made its way to you. It'd probably be there tomorrow. And he said, well, where are you anyway? And I said, well, I'm in India. And he said, oh, well, what time is it? And I said, well, it's midnight. And he said, gee, I'm so sorry to wake you. And he was very deferential that way. And 1987, um, I was leaving to move to New York. And a couple of the staff said, well, do you want another going away photo? And I sort of said, well, no. And then I said, well, yes, actually, I'd like to bring in, I was getting married at the time, I'd like to bring in my family and my fiance's family and um, you know, have a nice going away photo that way. So the staff said, sure, we'll set it up. and. So sure enough, everybody comes. We probably had close to 10 people and the president was fantastic. He spent a lot of time with us, gave everybody a gift. But what was amazing is I was walking out. He said, Michael, before you go, and I said, yes, Mr. President. He said, remember that time I woke you up in India? And I just stopped and was, you know, three years later with all that's on his mind that he was able to remember that one phone call um, you know, from, from quite a while ago. So that was uh, just one of the great stories that I like to tell about him. President Ronald Reagan's name comes up again and again and again. Not only his stand against communism and all he said about that, changing the dynamic geopolitically in the world forever, but also about his stand on social issues and taxes and taking a firm stand despite a lot of pushback. President Reagan had heard stories about victims of crime he was concerned. He created a task force to look into the issue. I chaired that task force. We found that we had a system that served lawyers and judges and defendants and ignored, mistreated, and most insidiously blamed victims of crime. We made recommendations to the president for change. He asked us to please implement those recommendations, and he therefore went forth to create the first office for victims of crime in the Department of Justice. That was huge. He then authored and supported an, the first victims of crime bill ever in the United States. Our concern for crime victims rests on far more than simple recognition that it could happen to any of us. It's also rooted in the realization that regardless of who is victimized or the extent to which any one of us may personally be threatened, all of us have an interest in seeing that justice is done not only to the criminal, but also for those who suffer the consequences of his crime. At the end of his term, almost every state had created a Victims of Crime Bill. What a record he made. I wish he was president now. President Reagan hosted a, a reception for me, and we decided that our guests would be folks who could not otherwise have an opportunity to meet the president. Like the little Southern girl whose dying wish through the Make-A-Wish Foundation was to meet Ronald Reagan and a young man from my hometown with a brain injury whose room was filled with pictures of Ronald Reagan. It was the best party I have ever attended. Such caring and compassion were typical of Ronald Reagan, the boss I so loved and revered. President Reagan taught us what it means to lead with courage, to take pride in being the best nation that this planet's ever seen, to be grateful for our exceptionalism, but not take it for granted. He was a man with honor and without hatred, driven by facts and in the spirit of progress and not personal attacks or lies. He led with grace and conviction, and he radiated excellence without arrogance while still getting results. President Reagan was not a man of guile. He was a man of truth and how he lived and how he led the country. He was inspiring. I once asked him what he would do to condemn his critics. And he said, no, 
He would tell them simply what he believed and ask them to join him. That was the way he was. In a historical period that began in turbulence, he was able to reassure the American people and the citizens of the world that better days were ahead. And to me, that is what true leadership means. He once said that there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And to me, there is no quote that better embodies the life and legacy of President Reagan than this. He was not a man looking out for himself or his own legacy. He was a man doing the best he could under the circumstances he found himself in. And that is what true leadership means. One of my fondest memories of eight years in the Reagan presidency is that not just the, uh, the, the, the deep philosophy that took place uh, during, the, during the, his presidency and we all, what we all discussed. It was also the sense that we were all there for a common reason is that we all understood that there was a framework on which Reagan was governing, and that was freedom. Freedom for the individual. We all operated under that, that rubric, under that framework. People around the globe can learn from Ronald Reagan. He was a fine actor, a very good governor of California, and one of the greatest American presidents. Reagan deregulated economy, cut taxes, brought freedom at home and abroad. He communicated great ideas, free markets, individual liberty, law and order. These ideas continue to inspire millions of people all over the world. This administration's objective will be a healthy, vigorous, growing economy that provides equal opportunities for all Americans with no barriers born of bigotry or discrimination. Putting America back to work means putting all Americans back to work. Ending inflation means freeing all Americans from the terror of runaway living costs. All must share in the productive work of this new beginning, and all must share in the bounty of a revived economy. With the idealism and fair play which are the core of our system and our strength, we can have a strong and prosperous America at peace with itself and the world. Democratic values need to be nurtured and constantly tended to. President Reagan knew this instinctively. He also knew it was never easy. Forty years after his first inauguration, President Reagan's instincts, his vision, and his capacity for inclusion not only stand the test of time, they grow stronger. Even though I wasn't alive for President Reagan's presidency, I am inspired by his legacy of leadership, of communication, of his willingness to stand up and protect our country and democracy globally. President Reagan was devoted to a strong defense for this country. And all of his work and all of his vision was something that I benefited from as Secretary of Defense and it still, it still is what goes to the heart of what makes the United States of America strong. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and hand it on for them to do the same. I am very impressed with President Reagan and the way he implemented this slogan, Peace Through Strength, because the strength was in all sorts of ways. Sometimes the directives to force, as in Grenada, other times having nothing to do with anything military, the strength was in the strength of the alliance and the very skillful way in which he conducted the bargaining, not simply with the Soviet Union, but with the European public. Ronald Reagan was one of our most consequential presidents, and his stand against communism really was unbelievable to watch. Early on in Ronald Reagan's presidency, he was asked, how did he see the Cold War ending? His answer was quite succinct. 
He said, we win, they lose. But before that happy consummation could occur, he had to recast the Cold War. So Ronald Reagan changed the rhetoric. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. As a young Soviet specialist, I remember when he said that the Soviet Union was the focus of evil in the world, that indeed Marxism and Leninism would end up on the ash heap of history because it was running against the tide of human freedom and human history. And I remember thinking that um, that was awfully strong language for a president of the United States to use about the other superpower. But I learned something from that. I learned that uh, Ronald Reagan was willing to speak the truth and that in speaking the truth, he set in motion forces and ideas that would transform the international system. I'll never forget the moment when he faced Gorbachev down in Reykjavik and the SDI initiative was the sticking point and R Gorbachev thought he could face down this cowboy actor. Instead, calm, resolute, firm Ronald Reagan said, we're going to defend America no matter what the cost. And Gorbachev said later, I knew that the Russian Socialist Republic was doomed. I was a pretty young guy, uh, feeling old now when I think back 40 years, but uh, in, I was in my mid-20s as an advance man for President Reagan. And we were dropped in Berlin uh, there in about 1986. We went out and looked at what the view would be looking into East Berlin from the Reichstag. May 18th, 1987, in the Oval Office, we speechwriters were going over a series of speeches with the president. Mine came last, and it was the draft that I had written for the president to deliver at the Berlin Wall. I explained, Mr. President, I learned when I was in Berlin that depending on weather conditions, people will be able to hear you on the other side of the wall, the communist side of the wall, as far east as Moscow. Is there anything in particular you'd like to say to people on the communist side of the wall? And the president thought for a moment and he said, well, there's that passage about tearing down the wall. That's what I'd like to say to those people. That wall has to come down. As uh, people back in the White House were uh, working on those, on those remarks, they told us to put a bulletproof piece of glass in so that the president could be seen with the wall in the background. He was well aware that his ordinance was on both sides of the wall, and he appealed to the universal desire for freedom. He said, we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. On Air Force One to Berlin, he was asked not to tell Gorbachev to tear down this wall. And he looked up and said, no, he wanted to do it, and he would, and he did. That was his way. The morning of the president's arrival, there were thousands of, of East Berliners that had come that wanted to be nearby to hear President Reagan speak on the other side of the wall, you know, right? They weren't free. And they actually used water cannons and dogs to to get rid of those people. So the president came and when he delivered those remarks, I can remember kind of getting goosebumps. Wasn't really understood uh, how prophetic those words were. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. They are here in the thousands, they are here in the tens of thousands. Occasionally they shout, Die Mauer muss weg, the wall must go. Thousands and thousands of West Germans come to make the point that the wall has suddenly become irrelevant. Something, as you can see, almost to party on. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? We were able to see the peaceful end of uh, communism in Eastern Europe. We were able to see the unification of Germany completely and totally in Western terms. And we were able to see the peaceful collapse of the Soviet Union itself. 
I remember thinking at that time that uh, Ronald Reagan had mattered. He'd mattered in speaking that truth to people who would then take it into their own hands to bring down those governments that indeed did end up on the ash heap of history. I believe that in that speech, he set the course for the final two years, two extremely consequential years. I'm sitting here in Eastern Europe, Tbilisi, Republic of Georgia, which when I was a child growing up in the United States had the misfortune of being a part of the Soviet Union, which he accurately called the evil empire. I was 14 when the Soviet Union collapsed and I had no idea that I was going to end up here. And I think about it all the time that I wouldn't be here if Ronald Reagan hadn't freed Eastern Europe. I was in Virginia when he died in 2004 and I stood in line over seven hours to walk past his coffin in the Capitol Rotunda. And I later thanked him at his grave at his presidential library in California for freeing Eastern Europe. The people here in Georgia are very grateful to you, Ronald Reagan. There's a statue of you in a park here in Tbilisi, and this fabulous country is free again thanks to you. And I wouldn't be here with my wife and my children wouldn't exist if it weren't for you. So thank you, Ronald Reagan. I believe that Ronald Reagan was the greatest conservative leader of our time and of really of the modern conservative movement. Before Reagan, the conservative movement was a intellectual movement and then later a political movement. But Ronald Reagan, as governor of California and president of the United States, turned it into a governing movement. He did this by showing that conservative ideas worked. He led the longest period of economic growth in the history of our United States. He led the forces that ultimately ended the Cold War with freedom winning, and he revived the spirit of the American people. Because of Ronald Reagan and his leadership, the United States, and indeed the world, became a better place. President Reagan also brought people together, building broad support I think for what I, what is what was a common sense group of ideas, but being willing to compromise when needed in order to get parts of his own agenda enacted. That's a lesson that uh, a number of our politicians and and leaders today uh, could learn from. Um, uh, he also stood for some timeless ideas like patriotism, which underpinned, I think, his faith in the inherent goodness of the American people. And that's why we are very fortunate that 40 years ago or so, he became president of the United States and was able to help the United States fulfill its destiny to be that beacon of freedom, that shining city on the hill. The hours shown class and poise uh, and a good temper throughout the entire period. He never lost his temper. He was always uh, careful, uh, thoughtful, uh, and a decent individual with a wonderful, marvelous sense of humor and, of course, a great ability to communicate with the American people. He was a very, very fine man. We're lucky to have had him as President of the United States for eight years. He, you know, he accomplished a tremendous amount. And uh, I mean, people still hark back to the days of Ronald Reagan, what a great leader he was. And that particularly in today's environment of gotcha politics, he was above that. He didn't play games. People knew where they stood. They knew where he stood. He reinvigorated America with a spirit that was absolutely critical to the success we've had and to the prosperity we've had over the last 40 years. President Reagan told us, those who say that we are in a time when there are no heroes, just don't know where to look. The same is true today. There are heroes who are the frontline workers against this pandemic, who are the friends and family supporting each other, getting through tough times. And there are heroes who are continuing the great American tradition of turning science fiction into reality, bringing great American innovations into being that seemed impossible even five years ago. It's, uh, it's really important right now to look back and learn a lesson from Ronald Reagan again, that the brightest days of America are still ahead of her, and that we have every right to dream heroic dreams. Learning about Ronald Reagan and his success as governor, president, father, and husband
caused me to reflect on my own persona. Through the years, I've tried to extract aspects of President Reagan's personality and impart them into my own way of being. When I think about President Reagan, it's not this golden gem of the past. It's a piece of the present and a vision for the future. To work for Ronald Reagan was so special. He was a unique, very unique man. The sun shone on him, and most presidents fade into the sunset. With him, it, he just keeps getting bigger and bigger every day. My friends, we did it. We weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made the city stronger. We made the city freer. And we left her in good hands. All in all, not bad. Not bad at all. And so, goodbye, God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.